You know, in a real way, uh, Bob did pray about the world events that are going on. And, you know, fundamentally, the Bible never guarantees a safety except for eternity. There's a place prepared. There's a... There's no tears in heaven. Um, to be saved, to mean sa- to be safe for eternity. And who are you saved from? You're saved from God, from the wrath of God. And so God does promise that there's a, there's a safety that we will have for eternity. But when you, when you study the Bible, there's, there's a lot of violence in the Bible. You know, you think about Adam and Eve, where we're, we're born into this perfect environment, and then the temptation happened, and then they broke the, God's rules, and then, so God does believe in boundaries. There's blessings in the boundaries that God gives us, and so anybody who tells you that they're a Christian with no boundaries is, that's a fantasy. That's, uh, that just means you're still living and you're, you're still the king of your, queen of your life, and so God does put great boundaries in our life because he wants to bless us within that, and so we see Adam and Eve, and they were given the, the direction just not to eat the fruit from the tree. And the temptation happened, they did, and then they had, Ad, they had Cain and Abel, and then we see the first murder. Yeah. This was before social media, this was before arguing over territory, this was, this was just the jealousy, it was envy, it was just, it was just the depth of, of darkness that the human can go to. Yeah. And so, really, we birthed out of that, we have, we have faith, and we have the whole plan of God, and then in order for the people to expand, there was wars, and there was, you know, there'd be whole towns where, in biblical times, where whole towns would get wiped out, you know, and God would still work through all this. He'd work through the prophets, and he'd work through the, the different people that he'd raise up. He'd sp- he spoke through a burning bush. He spoke through a donkey. He spoke through, through people. His spirit was just moving, and then Jesus was born, and as Jesus was born, then Herod had issued a decree that all those two and under would be, there was a massacre of, of babies. And so even birthed in all of this, there was a lot of terror that was going on in the world. And, and now in our day, there's, there's terror that's still going on in our world today. It doesn't change the fact that God still loves us, that the Bible's perfect, and that God has a plan for each and every one of our lives. You know, in recent history over the last few hundred years, in 1775 was the American Revolution. And that took place here in the, in the U.S. as the English colonists, they came here to start a new life. They, they sailed across the sea and they found it up in the northeast. You know, you got the whole like Boston and New York and Maine area. And, and they, 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 those became the 13 colonies. And, but then what happened? The, Britain wanted to impose their power even over them as they had come here. And so that created a war where people fought back. And, and there was war. That was the American Revolution. As, as our country developed out in 1861, there was the Civil War. Our country started to fight against itself. People were divided. It was terrible. In 1914, there was World War. It was World War I. Germany, Italy, and Austria-Hungary versus Britain, France, and Russia. And then we stepped in to help Britain and France and Russia. Then in 1939, there was World War II. Germany, Italy, and Japan versus the United States and Great Britain, France, and Russia. In 1950, there was the Korean War, where the U.S. and South Korea were against North Korea. You know, in recent times, relatively to to all that's gone on, there was Vietnam, the war in Iraq, the ISIS sting that happened, the Al-Shabaab militants, so many ongoing wars that that the news doesn't even report about is happening all over the world. You know, very recently... Somehow my notes got erased here, so bear with me here. Recently I was reading my Bible. Uh, can anybody relate? Recently you were reading your Bible? Hmm. Recently I was sharing my faith. Okay, here we go. Uh, but in a, in a very somber and real way, in, um, Saturday, the Hamas militant group attacked Israel over the weekend, prompting the Israeli prime minister to declare we are at war. It was the deadliest attack in Israel in decades, leaving at least 250 dead and thousands wounded. 
according to Israel's National Emergency Service. People came on and said, if you have a gun, now's the time to grab it. And today's the day to be a hero. There's people right now in a state of war. We know there was the recent, uh, the Ukraine and the Russia um, situation. And, and, and that was a real situation for many families. It's not real for us right now, but it, but it could be real for us one day. And for us, we've got to make sure our convictions are solid. We've got to have a, we need a plan appropriately, amen? <laughs> but we need a plan to have faith no matter what happens as well. You know, one of the, as the war became more and more common, in 1812, there was a famous uh, Uncle Sam, he became a common national personification in the U.S., and he encouraged people to list in the U.S. Army. Since then, Uncle Sam has been a popular symbol of the U.S. government and American culture and a manifestation of patriotic emotion. You know, if you've ever seen those posters where you got Uncle Sam and he's just pointing straight at you. And these, were, these moved people's hearts because it, it really focused on the individual. It wasn't that, hey, we are at war and somebody's going to go to war. These posters were very, hey, we're at war and we want you. And the tagline was, I want you for the U.S. Army. Some even said that the way the poster was, when you moved left to right, it felt like the eyes were following you. <laughs> That's how much of an ownership they wanted people to take and... And people became part of something. They joined the U.S. Army. Do we have any uh, veterans here in the, in the house today? Thank you guys for your service. People joined the Army. They became part of something that was greater than themselves, and they fought for a cause, and, and they wanted to defend something. There was a clear reason. They didn't care about fear. What people said, they didn't care about the risk. They were all in because they wanted to protect and defend something. This morning, we're not here to be trained up to go to war. We're here to be a part of the spiritual battle. And we got to get trained up to be all in. we got to know that there's a risk when you become a Christian. There's a, there, there could be persecution. There could be hardship. There could be radical changes in your life. But we've got to have a conviction that we're going to enter the spiritual battle. Our hearts have got to be moved to fight in the spiritual battle because it is all around us today. And today we're not saying, I want you for the U.S. Army. We're here saying that Jesus wants you for his spiritual kingdom. And that's the title of our lesson this morning. Jesus wants you. You know, so often we can make things general. And we can say, that's for you. Or that's for that person over there. Man, that person over there needs Jesus. But this morning, we got to focus in and realize that you need Jesus. Jesus wants you in your current situation. He wants me. In my current situation, I can't make it about somebody else or I can't make it some mythical idea that down the road it's a thing. No, today, here in this room today, Jesus wants you. And if you can focus in and realize that about you, you'll stop pointing at other people and you'll let the scriptures change your life. And as the scriptures change your life, you'll go forward and you'll help change many other people. Let's open our Bibles here to John chapter 6. I've been going through the book of John for my, my quiet times recently, and if you're new here and you don't know what a quiet time is, it's just a time that you get to sit down and spend reading your Bible and in prayer so as to become more of a spiritual person and, and have the fuel that you need to be the man or woman that God's called you to be. We're not just going to get this stuff because we, we think positive thoughts. Christianity is not something you just absorb because the person next to you believes it. Christianity, it's bestowed from somebody to somebody. God is working, and that's what we're going to look at today. Is Our first point today is God is reaching out to you. That's our first point. God is reaching out to you. But man, is he going to use other people. He is going to use other people. But, but before we get into the other people part, we're going to look at how God is reaching out to each and every one of us. In John chapter 6, we'll pick up here in verse 43. It says, stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. <laughs> Imagine if that was your interaction with Jesus. <laughs> He's like, I know you've been talking to people, and, and it's not spiritual. Stop, just stop it. Knock it off. He had to even tell the disciples sometimes, stop grumbling among yourself. Okay, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. 
No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Here's Jesus teaching, and Jesus wants them to cut out all the grumbling. Imagine your life with no more grumbling. Could you do it? Do you even want to do it? Jesus just says, stop grumbling. You know, we could live a life where you don't complain about anything else. And I believe as Christians, we should should have a goal to live a very similar life. Because the Bible says do everything without complaining or arguing. Go take it up with God if you have fellowship with complaining in your regular lifestyle. But here he says, stop grumbling. He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him in. And so here we understand from the scriptures that nobody can come to God unless God starts working in their life before anybody else reaches out to them. God starts to really work in somebody's life and starts drawing them near towards God, towards Jesus, towards an understanding of who the Messiah is. See, the understanding that we get from this passage is that God draws us through something, but then it's up to us to actually listen and then to learn You know, I believe most people realize that they're drawn towards the Bible. When you read something about turn the other cheek, or you read something about judge not, yet you be judged. When you read something about forgiveness, when you read something about kindness, it draws the human heart to it. But not everybody's going to listen to it and really learn from it. See, God does the hard work, and God prompts us. God draws us towards him, but we got to make a decision that we're going to listen. What does it take to listen? It takes time. Active listening is is one of the greatest traits that somebody can have. But to listen takes effort. It means you you got to stop listening to something else. You know, for you here this morning, are you willing to stop listening to social media for a time or stop listening to the worries of this life for a time and and take a half hour, take an hour to sit down with somebody who invited you out and, and just listen to what the Bible has to say? Because God will do all the work to draw you near him, but it's up to you to really to really listen and learn. And it's not until you start to learn that your mind starts to open up. Until you start to listen, that your heart starts to hear what's going on. And you start to get a vision for the life that God wants you to have. But maybe you're here today and you say, well, how do I know if God's drawing me to Jesus? How do I really know? Am I one of the lucky ones? Because you can kind of read this and say, well, man, if, if God's not really drawing me, well, then it's not really my fault. I'll just keep going about my life until, until God gets to work. But Psalm 19 says that God created the whole world and the heavens are constantly pouring forth speech to the entire world. The Bible says the trees, when the wind blows, they're they're clapping. They're giving an applause to God. That's what the trees are doing. The Bible says in Romans 1, it says everything that God created, it shows his invisible qualities so that mankind is without any excuse. And so if you're here today wondering if you're one of the lucky ones, yes, you are one of the lucky ones. Everybody in this world... God is already speaking to everybody in a great way. It's just whether or not people are learning and people are listening. Well, today we're going to look at a few ways that God grabs our attention. Let's go over to John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, we'll pick up here in verse 23. It says, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. Amen, guys? It's okay to, know, to be going through some stuff in life. <laughs> Jesus makes a definitive statement. My heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it, said it, was, it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. 
He said this, this to show the kind of death he was going to live. You see, the first way that, that God draws people to Jesus is through the gospel. It's through the, it's through the crucifixion. It's through the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial, and then through the resurrection of Jesus. People are drawn to that. Man, that somebody would live a perfect life and teach these incredible things that only could come from God. Live a perfect life and then give up their entire life and be treated like a criminal, like the most heinous of people in all the world. And then God would raise him from the dead so that when we now look to Jesus, it's like Moses in the, in the desert. He had the bronze snake. When people looked to it, they were forgiven and they were healed. And Jesus is saying, when I'm raised up, people are going to look to me and they're going to find healing. They're going to find what they need in their life. And so the first way that God draws us to Jesus is through the facts of what happens in the Bible. You can't help but read the Bible and let your heart get moved. You know, it's been such an honor doing Bible studies with Samaje. And uh, Samaje is an incredible man. This guy has done so much in the kingdom. And uh, many, many of you guys know Samaje, but, but Samaje has just been going through the passion account. He's like, man, you know, we did the cross study. I watched the passion. I went through Matthew. I went through Mark. I went through Luke. I went through John. I'm, I'm reading books. I'm doing, I'm, I'm connecting. And, and we had a study last night and he's read through all this. And he said, man, I got to go through it again and put my name in it. See, as God draws us to him through the scriptures, what happens is we come to Jesus. And here the Bible says that Jesus, this voice wasn't for Jesus. He says, this is for your benefit. And as you read the scriptures and God starts to speak to you, it's not for Jesus. The scriptures are for you. The scriptures are meant to give you faith and to draw you towards a relationship with Christ, a relationship with leaving your sin behind and making a decision to repent and take on your life the standard of being a disciple and then building a testimony where you get baptized and you, you become a part of Christ. And then you go forward with your life to make disciples and live out this great cause that Jesus has given us to live. Jesus draws us to him through the scriptures and what he did. Well, let's go over to John chapter 16. Let's look at the next way that God draws us to Jesus. In John 16, we'll pick up here in verse 5. It says, Now I'm going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counsel will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, the next way that God draws us to him is, and God is reaching out to you and me today is the Bible says that when Jesus goes up to heaven, he's no longer going to be on the earth. He says, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to convict the world. So it's not just the scriptures, but the scriptures were written by the Holy Spirit. It's not just the message of the gospel. God has now sent his spirit into the world to convict the world of guilt and sin. And so somebody does not have to be in a saved relationship with God to be impacted by the Holy Spirit. A terrorist could wake up in the middle of the night with no, no desire to change their life. And wake up in holy fear realizing that they are not in a right relationship with God. That's the Holy Spirit convicting that person. Somebody can go about their life and feel bad about things. Somebody can even call themselves a Christian and feel bad about sin and, and continue to live in sin. But Because we know the Bible says that you're not going to continue to live in sin in your lifestyle if you have a relationship with God. But you can continue to call yourself a Christian and live in sin and the Holy Spirit continue to convict you and feel like you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is outside of you just convicting you. And the Holy Spirit is pushing you. It's pushing me. It's pushing all of us to go towards Jesus and become the men and women that God has called us to be. You see, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been through, no matter your age or your, your status in life, you could be a millionaire or you could be living on a street corner. There's still a standard of the Bible that everybody's got to become a disciple. You need to be baptized. You need to live your life as a disciple of Jesus if you're going to be in a right relationship with God. 
And the Holy Spirit and the scriptures will always push you to get to that place. Well, that's the work that God is doing. What, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> well, let's go over to John chapter 17. Look here in verse 20. It says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. See, it's amazing. These, these apostles, the disciples were called at some point. And they didn't know the message. It was Jesus' message. It was God's message. But it wasn't their message yet. And as they spent time with Jesus and they could confidently say, we've given up everything to follow you, that we are your disciples, that we will walk with you, they could now say, Jesus looked at them and he said, my message is now your message. You know, my question to you today is, is your message Jesus' message? Wow. If somebody asked you what it means to be a Christian, is it the same thing that Jesus would say? If somebody says, well, well how do you get into a right relationship with God? Is your message Jesus' message? Yeah. You see, Jesus looked at them and he said, man, people are going to believe through your message. But their message, they had walked so closely with Jesus that they had adopted his full message to become the message that they would take their stand on. At the end of the day, God, through the cross, the resurrection, the Holy Spirit, and the disciples who preach the word of God, we are all being called and drawn towards Jesus by the power of God. But my question is, are you listening? This morning, I mean, really, are you walking with God? Not that anybody here needs to have it all together because we're never going to have it all together. And talk to me, I definitely don't have it all together. But there is a difference in someone who's fully surrendered and somebody who hasn't. You know, this morning, whether you've been a Christian for 20 years, whether you're just visiting here and you don't even know where you are if you're a Christian or not, God is reaching out to you. And it is very important for each and every one of us to say, God, God didn't start reaching out to you and then you got baptized and you just went and started reaching out to somebody else. No, God's still reaching out to you today. In your situation, God wants to level you up. He wants you to help, help you become more spiritual. He wants you to be stronger and more faithful and more effective. God is reaching out to you. He's reaching out to me. Let's not look at the person next to us. But for this point, let's look at ourselves and say, man, I got to learn and listen for what God is reaching out for me to do. Well, point number two is it's time we all love the battle. Let's go over to Revelation chapter 12. You know, in our world today, we're surrounded by by threat in a sense. I'm only 38, but, but our world feels different than it did 20 years ago. It feels like we've lost a wholesomeness. It's almost like we've lost a, an authenticity about us. It's like with the presence of, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, Satan's got a master plan to evangelize the world. And Jesus has a master plan to evangelize the world. It's just the world we live in, it's, it's, it's harder to get people to buy into Jesus' plan than it is to get people to fall into Satan's plan. That's why you're made into a disciple. You fall away from, from truth. That's why it's a fall. It's not like a, you got to get made into something. And so it takes, it takes more effort to do what's right in the eyes of God than it does to just blend in with the rest of the world. And so... What we got to understand is we got to learn to love the battle. I mean, we live in a time, there used to be a time where it was like, hey, this is wrong, and you can say it's wrong, and yet it's okay to say it's wrong. But now we live in a time where it's like, okay, this, is, this was wrong last year. It's, it's still wrong, but we're going to act like it's not wrong. And if you say it's wrong, then you're wrong because you're, un, you're not fitting in with our system. So it's a very, like, confusing kind of time. But for Christians, we got to uphold the Bible. The Bible's not going to change because the culture changes. I mean, we have been through times when judges ruled the world. The Bible was still the same. Where kings ruled the world, the Bible was still the same. God's people were flourishing. The Bible still said what the Bible said. God's people were captives. The Bible still what said what the Bible said. There was no room in the inn for Jesus to stay, and David lived in a castle. The Bible's still going to say what the Bible says. And for us, when we buy into the reality of what the Bible teaches, we don't get duped by what the world teaches. And so for us, we've got to learn how to love the battle. And honestly, guys, there's been times when 
when I've struggled to love the battle. Because I look around me and I'm like, man, look at this world. Maybe there's an easier way to, to, do, to be righteous. Maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a, a more beneficial way in some, that benefits some area of your life. But when you read the Bible, the Bible's going to say what the Bible says. Look here in Revelation chapter 12. Here in verse 7 it says, And there was war in heaven. Man, there's war on earth. There's war in heaven. There's... God, God allows things to happen. Heaven's his domain, but, but there's war in heaven? It says, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The, dra- the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses him before God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. You see here we got this picture and you can study out what you believe from a theology standpoint. I believe that this was sometime between the creation of the world and, and the serpent in the garden. So Genesis 3. At some point God had there was, there was heaven and there was war and, and Satan was cast down and, and the, the angels with him and, and now you got Adam and Eve who were born into this, into a relationship with God, but there's the, the, the temptation of evil. And, and instead of loving the battle, there was, a, there was a, well, let's try out something else. Wow. Let me tell you, that's a dangerous place for a Christian to be is let's try out something else. When you realize there's a battle, you got to pick a side. There's good and evil. There's not a middle ground about what you're going to do. Whether we choose to recognize it or not, the spiritual battle is going on all around us. I've never done the experiment before, but I've heard that if you put a frog in boiling water, it will jump right out because it's frightened. It's shocked. It realizes the gravity of the situation, and so it, it immediately reacts and gets out of it because it does not want to be in boiling water. But I've heard that what happens is if you put a frog in a room temperature pot of water and you slowly turn up the heat and because it's cold-blooded, the the temperature slowly rises, the frog will then boil to death because it was a gradual, gradual change. I don't know about you guys, but this is a boiling hot scripture that we just read. (laughs) Sometimes you can read the Bible and it's very casual. It's like, well, maybe it's a battle, maybe it's not, maybe it's a mindset, maybe it's a perspective, maybe, it's a, maybe, maybe that's what you need, that's what I need. No, the Bible says there, there was war, and it goes on, it says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. That's how we're going to overcome this spiritual battle. It's through faith in Jesus, it's through being in Christ, and it's using your testimony to speak against anything that's anti-Jesus. This is a pretty boiling hot scripture. <laughs> and if you look at the scriptures and you kind of like feel like the scriptures are kind of like, you know, maybe for you, not really. It's easy to kind of like gradually like be around the Bible, but then eventually just die without making any big decisions in your life. But when you realize that God is a, a fiery hot God, you realize that the scriptures are fiery hot. We got to get in them. We got to jump away from the things that God doesn't love. We got to run towards the thing that God says we do love that he loves, we start to love the battle. And we start to use our testimony in such a great way. You know, I'm so grateful to be here in DFW with all the disciples here in Dallas-Fort Worth. And uh, I'm so amazed by all the amazing testimonies in the church. I feel like the more I share my faith with people, the more I'm in Bible studies with people, the more I just get to hear people's stories, I start to realize, wow, every single member in the Dallas-Fort Worth International Christian Church has a rock-solid testimony about how they were converted to Jesus. We're blown away by the blood of the Lamb, and we use this testimony to stay faithful and overcome ourselves, but also to help other people overcome as well. I mean, at the end of the day, in Acts chapter 2, those 3,000 who got baptized, didn't they have a testimony? What was their testimony that said, man, we were religious, we read our scriptures, and 
But you know what? I heard Peter preach the word and, and he called us to fully repent and make Jesus Lord. And we repented. We made Jesus Lord. We got baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Man, we got devoted right away and we started building the church. And that became their testimony. You look at Acts chapter 8 and you read about Simon the sorcerer. He was like, man, I, I heard Philip preach the word and, and I left all my stuff behind and I got baptized and I just followed him around wherever he went. You hear the Ethiopian eunuch. He was like, man, I was religious and I was living about my life and I had a cush life. It was great. And all of a sudden God put Philip in my life and we studied the Bible for days and days or however long it was. The Bible says as they went along their road, that trip could have been a month. It says on their journey, they just were studying. It could, have been, it could have been a day. It could have been three days. I don't know. But his testimony was, man, God put a disciple in my life. We studied the Bible. I made some decisions, and I made a stop, and I made the chariot get stopped, and, and he baptized me. That's my testimony. Think about the Philippian jailer in Acts 16. He's like, man, my testimony was I was, I was a, a, a prison guard who was, you know, knocking all the Christians, and then, Man, the gates opened. God started moving in my life. I had to listen to the disciples, man. Once they preached the word, I invited them to my house. And man, we studied the Bible. I believed the message. And man, I got baptized and I just waited on them right away. I started serving disciples right away. In Acts 18, the Corinthian church, it began with the synagogue ruler. He believed and he got baptized. And that became the Corinthian church, I believe. And in Acts 19, the Ephesians, they were walking along. They were disciples. But they hadn't been baptized into Christ. And so they got baptized and that became their testimony. Now I think about it here today is, do you have a testimony? We all have a story. We all have been through some stuff. But, but the testimony we see in and out of the Bible was, man, I was going about my life. And God did something in my life. It didn't mean that I was... I was in a right relationship with God because of that. It got me to consider a lot. And it changed my perspective. And, but throughout the Bible, if you're going to see somebody really get converted and really become in Christ, God puts a disciple into their life. They start to study the scriptures. They start to make some life, big life changes. They get baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And they start working with other disciples to build the kingdom and spread what they've been given. You know, for you here today, are, one, do you have a testimony that looks like that? And two, are you using it? My challenge for us as we leave here today is use your testimony this week. Please don't compare your testimony to somebody else's. I've talked to disciples before and they're like, man, my testimony is not as powerful as your testimony. No, your, your testimony is just as powerful as anybody else's testimony. Jesus still paid the same price for you as he paid for that guy over here. And when you use it, and when you own it, and when you overcome with your testimony, what happens is God is very much glorified. Well, what happens when we all have this? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we'll pick up here in verse 1. It says, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry... We do not lose heart. Anybody ever lost heart before? Man, I've been there. That's tough. But when you get back to God's mercy, and you get back to the ministry that we get to have, where everybody's got a testimony, everybody's a disciple, everybody believes in God and, and the power of God, and we're sharing our faith, and, and we're, we're studying the Bible with people, and we're helping one another. We got life skills. Appreciate the Kenans running an incredible life skills program. And we got... We got singles events happening and marriage events and chemical recovery. We got all these incredible things that help people get stronger and stronger. It's through God's mercy. We get to have this ministry. And the Bible says we don't lose heart. There's enough in the kingdom to get you going. You don't have to be involved in everything, but you got to be involved in something. Yeah. 2 Corinthians 4, it goes on in verse 2. It says, rather we've renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. 
For God who said, light, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You see, this goes on and, and, and it paints the picture of this battle. And it paints this picture that we can be in this battle. And because of the ministry and because of God's mercy, we can keep heart even though Satan's out there blinding the minds of unbelievers. Even though the word's being distorted and there's doctrines all over the place, we can still be faithful. Even though we come across people day after day whose, whose hearts and minds are blinded by unbelief. People have put more faith in this world than they've put in our God. We meet people all the time, and, and if, we're careful, if we're not careful, we can find ourselves right in that place. We'll put our faith in the world and not in the words. And when you find a ministry of baptized disciples who are living out this vision, it's priceless. And I don't know where you're at today, but I want to encourage you to study the Bible with whoever invited you out. Find out what we're all about. Find out the scriptures that have spoken to our hearts. We want them to speak to your hearts. We want to be able to build up something here that's going to glorify God in such a way that, that the Bible says, let light shine out of darkness in this ministry. And what is that a quote of? It's Genesis 1 verse 3. It's when God looked at the whole world and there was nothing. And how do you create something out of nothing? It's impossible for man, but not with God. Everything is possible with God. It's impossible for you and me on our own accord to convert a blind person to see the spirit with spiritual eyes. If you talk to somebody who's blind and ask them to describe the color green, how would you do it? They couldn't do it. Now, if you, were, you could see green, had to go explain that to a blind person, how would you do it? It's impossible. I believe what God is saying here is in the same way that God created the world, when it was full of darkness, and he made light in a dark place, he says, yes, we're in the spiritual battle. Yes, the God of this age who Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they can't see the light. But you know who can help see the light? Jesus can help somebody see the light. And when we let the scriptures work in somebody's life, we know that the Holy Spirit is working in somebody's life. And God's message becomes our message. And we instill it inside of other people. What's going to happen is we're going to be in the battle ourselves. And let me tell you, in the battle, you're going to lose some, some people in the battle. You're going to lose some, some, some grit in the battle at times. But you've got to have your battle buddies. Those are the fellow disciples around you. And we've got to keep studying the Bible with people. We've got to keep making the scriptures known in this dark and blind world. And God is the one who's going to bring the light in. God is going to move the hearts. The scales are going to fall off of people's eyes. The veils are going to be lifted in people's lives. And God's word is going to take place. And people are going to become true disciples of Jesus. But don't you see the battle we live in today? And I did a, a short Bible discussion. And if you're visiting, we, we believe in having weekly Bible discussions here in the, in the church. We have a uh, a men's and midweek, we alternate women and men, women's and men's midweek every Wednesday evening where we get together. We have our church service on Sunday. We have devotionals throughout the week. And one of the things that's so special about our fellowship is we have in our homes or in a, a smaller setting or even outdoors sometimes or maybe at a, a public place, we have what's called a Bible discussion. And it's where maybe 10 or so people get together. It could be smaller or bigger than that. It doesn't really matter. But you get together and maybe there's some food and there's kind of an icebreaker question that you open with. And, and then you look at some scriptures that are going to really help you kind of make some decisions pretty quickly. But, but then hopefully it prompts you to want to study the Bible. Remember one time I was doing a Bible discussion and I said, I gave everybody a note card and I said, do we believe the Bible's perfect? And people said, well, of course. Do you believe there's anything you'd like to change about the Bible? <laughs> and then people were like, well, I, I, I could think of something. I said, how about we do this? I think there's like 11 people. I said, there's 11 of us. And I brought note cards. And I said, why don't you write down on that note card the one thing that you'd like to change from the Bible? And we went around, everybody, everybody did it pretty quickly, you know. I was like, I wish I could. And um, so I, I read, and I'll read, I'll read uh, what people had written. I said, welcome to Bible Talk. Uh, we're a group that believes in um, building up the people and 
uh, making exceptions, uh, but we love God. And so here, um, it's okay to get drunk, it's okay to do drugs and have sex outside of marriage, it's okay to curse people out and hit people who bother you, it's okay to watch pornography, love money, lie, and cheat when you feel like it's necessary. You guys want to be a part of this group? That was just changing one thing. Does God expect you and me to submit to his word? Absolutely. It's not about you and me. It's about God. If there's something that somebody's not willing to give up, if there's something that somebody's going to bear the name like Christ, but refuse to give up something that's anti-Christ, what happens is God is not glorified in your life. Sin is glorified in your life. And let me reiterate, we don't believe that you have to be perfect. I still struggle with stuff to this day, guys. I struggle with stuff I read about in the Bible. I said, I'm never going to struggle with this stuff again. I'm struggling with about it this morning. We're going to struggle. But there's a, there's a difference between deciding that you're going to live a lifestyle of it versus deciding that you're going to repent of it and leave it in the past and fight your way to be righteous through whatever God, God allows you to go through in your life. See, we're not those who are called to become numb to the battle. You're not the frog that's supposed to be in the water that, that slowly, slowly you let little bits of things creep in. And, and you can use this in the sense of sin. Well, I'll let this one sin creep in. It's just a look. Oh, well, now that look manifests and it's just a thought. And then that thought's like, well, it's just a website. And then you can go down that rabbit hole. And before you know it, because you were so numb at the beginning, you just let the temperature get hotter and hotter and hotter. Before you know it, you're spiritually dead because you didn't get radical when you should have. For us, if the Bible says it's sin, you got to be the frog that, that, that sees it. And if you, you find yourself in it, you got to jump out of it. Because man, that wants to have you. It wants to master you. It wants to ruin your life. The enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. But God wants us to have life and life to the full. And in that life, it's going to be a battle. But we can win as we continue to stay linked up with Jesus. Our third point as we close out is heaven is worth the fight. Let's go to Revelation 21. Heaven is worth the fight. Maybe you're sitting here today and say, all right, Mr. Preacher Man, but it's just way easier to live a different way. And honestly, you may be right. You may be right. Um, it's, it's, it, it is harder to do the right thing. It's true. Jesus says you're going to have to deny yourself. There'll be times you've got to carry your cross on a daily basis. Uh, you'll go through hardship. But here we understand that you can overcome. And, and when you read the Bible and you look at the cross and you look at the message of Jesus, it, it attracts us because it, it calls the greatest out of us. And I think of why people want to go and be a part of a certain sports team or want to be a fan of a sp certain sports team. And I know we got some diehard cowboy fan in here, but, you know, some of y'all became Chiefs fans the other week, you know what I mean? And so... Hopefully, hopefully nobody in here, you never know. But I believe we want to become a part of something that calls us to greatness. And that's Jesus. Jesus didn't call us to be mediocre. He didn't call us to be religious. He didn't mean us to kind of follow him. He says, man, if you come follow me, I'm going to show you such incredible things in your life. We're going to build a partnership that, that's going to blow your mind. In 2 Corinthians 1, or 1 Corinthians 1, it says we're called into fellowship with the Spirit. That's how God wants to walk with us in this way. But heaven is worth the fight. Let's close out here, Revelation 21. In verse 1 it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down on, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men. And he will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I'm going to make everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. 
He said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He or she who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God. And he will be my child. You know, I read this and say, man, are we going to go through some battles here in this life? Yes, we are. But Jesus says there's going to be a time where there's no more death. There's no more war that's going to be going on. We live in a time right now where, where, where countries have declared war. And there may be a ripple effect on that for us, but absolutely we need to respond with faith. And we need to pray for wisdom. We need to pray for our leaders. Whatever your political stance is, the Bible calls, if you're going to bear the name Christian, you've got to pray for those who are in power. We've got to pray for them to have wisdom. Right now we've got, we've got the, national, the U.S. government and the, fighting with Texas. I mean, we're putting up different parameters and, and the, the governor's taking them down and then the U.S. Is, is, or go, the government here is putting them up. The U.S. is taking them down. The government's putting them back up twice fold. I mean, literally, people were taken who were brought to this country and they're, they're put on the doorstep of Kamala Harris. I mean, there's a lot going on in our lives right now. But there's going to be a day. There will be a day where every tear is wiped away. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more mourning. And that's going to be reserved for the faithful disciples of Jesus. You know, it's easy to keep up with what's going on around the world. And, and worry can start to creep into your life. To be honest, guys, I, I felt worry when I was reading about all that was going on. And I caught myself and I said, I've got to be a disciple. And for you, keep up with what's going on around the world. Be prepared. Take precautions. Do great things. But don't let your worry replace your faith. Make a decision that you are going to stop. You're going to pray. You're not going to become somebody who's just going to be, who's going to run from the battle. You're going to continue to run to the fight. Because the Bible says that God has heaven prepared for the faithful. God is eager to dwell with the faithful. God's eager to get rid of all the death and pain and tears. God's eager to quench out the thirst. As we overcome, we inherit what God has prepared for us. And you've got to realize that Jesus wants you this morning. God is reaching out to you. It's time to love the battle and continue to reach out to others. I know we've got people who are counting the cost in this room today. And you're close to getting baptized. I want to encourage you. Make the decision to become a disciple of Jesus. Those you're wrestling for and maybe you're not sure if they're really going to make it. Guys, Satan's blinded the eyes of people. We've got to keep putting the word of God, we got to let the spirit do the work. And it, over time, people are going to see with spiritual eyes as we love the battle. And we've got to remember that heaven is worth the fight. And to God be all the glory.